how well do you understand Newton's laws? If you studied any amount of physics, you will have come across Newton's three laws of motion. They're one of the first things you learn in any introductory physics course, and everything else in the course is founded on these laws. They're like the three pillars supporting the Tower of Physics. They're most commonly stated as follows. Law 1, the law of inertia. An object at rest will remain at rest, or, if in motion, will remain in motion at a constant speed and in a straight line unless acted on by an unbalanced force. Whew, don't worry. The others are much shorter. Law 2, F equals MA. And Law 3, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So simple to state, but unfortunately, as a physicist who has been teaching physics for over a decade, I have found that way too many students misunderstand the true meaning of these laws, and as a result, their physics tower is leaning. And it's not even their fault. These laws are often explained in ambiguous or downright confusing ways, and some really important points are often glossed over. So in this video, I'm going to break it down and reveal the biggest misconceptions about these laws. See if you have any of them. I'll also reveal what each law really means and how to use it so that you can write your leaning tower of physics and ace your exams. We'll start with a second law because it's the most used one. F equals MA, right? Wrong. But wait, isn't that what I just wrote down? Yes, unfortunately, Newton's second law is often referred to in this way. F equals MA, practically synonymous with physics. But writing it in this way is misleading at best, and at worst, just plain wrong. Here is how it is just plain wrong. Writing it in this way leads many students to interpret this equation as the definition of a force, that there is a force, which is MA. But MA is not a force. The definition of a force is an interaction between two objects, which simply means a push or a pull exerted by one object on another object. This is really important. You need two objects for a force. If you can't identify the two objects interacting, it is not a force. Consider the force of gravity. Can we identify the object exerting this force? If you're thinking gravity, gravity is not an object. What's happening is that the force of gravity that you are feeling right now is actually the pulling force exerted by the entire mass of planet Earth, object one, on you, object two. So this is a legit force. The normal force is a pushing force exerted by one surface on another, like my right palm pushing on my left palm when I squeeze them together. So this is also a force. Can you identify the object exerting the MA? Remember, acceleration is not an object. So the answer is no, and MA is not a force. Quick aside, the centripetal force, mv squared over r, is also not a force for the same reason, but we can get into that in a different video. You may be thinking, well, the left side of the equation is not just f, it should be f net. And yes, absolutely, writing f net on the left has taken us out of just plain wrong territory, but we're still in the misleading territory, and here's why. Many students interpret this equation as the acceleration causing an f net force, because by convention, Whenever we write a cause-effect relationship, we write it from right to left, with the independent variables on the right and the dependent variable on the left, signifying that the thing on the left depends on or is caused by the things on the right. But in this case, it's the other way around. If I push this box and it accelerates, did its acceleration cause my push? Or did my push cause its acceleration? Obviously, forces cause acceleration, so the acceleration is the dependent variable and should go on the left. So the most meaningful way to write Newton's second law, which also provides a roadmap for how to use it, is the acceleration of an object equals the sum of all forces exerted on the object over the mass of the object. I've replaced F net with sum of all forces because that makes it more clear what F net actually is and how to calculate it. Every term in your sum better be a real force exerted on your object by another object. Writing it this way makes it clear that all the pushes and pulls exerted on your object cause the object's resulting acceleration, which also depends inversely on the mass. Let's move on to the third law, often stated as, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. 
Here's a mass on a horizontal surface. We have gravity acting down with magnitude mg. You've all seen this before, right? Now I ask you, what is the magnitude of the normal force? Most students, including myself when I was first learning physics, think that these are equal and opposite action-reaction forces from Newton's third law and immediately say Fn equals mg. But in fact, this is wrong. These are not a third law action-reaction pair and thus are not necessarily equal and opposite. So if you just wrote Fn equals mg blindly, you might make a mistake. Even in this seemingly simple example, Fn may not be mg. I have actually not given you enough information in the wording of the problem to determine what it is. What I said was, a mass m on a horizontal surface and the gravitational force is mg. Can you identify what is missing? And under what circumstances would Fn have a magnitude that is greater than or less than mg? I'll reveal the missing information in a moment, but first, I want to briefly discuss why I think this is such a prevalent misconception. I believe it stems from the quintessential early physics example of a book at rest on a stationary table. This is the root of all evil. In this case, Fn is equal and opposite to Fg, but not because of Newton's third law. But when students hear the words equal and opposite describing two forces, their minds naturally go to the third law, which they probably just learned recently. And unless great care is taken by the instructor to nip this incorrect association in the bud at this early stage, it takes root and leads to huge problems later on. This is by no means a trivial thing to do. None of the online resources, that I'm aware of at least, even mention this potential pitfall. The best way to sort through what is going on is to be explicit about which objects are interacting when labeling a force. So for example, Fn is the force exerted by the table on the book. So let's write Ft on B. And Fg is the force exerted by the Earth on the book. So let's write Fe on B. Just writing the forces this way already gives a big clue as to what is going on. They cannot possibly be an action-reaction pair because they are interactions between different pairs of objects. An action-reaction pair must describe the same interaction. Object A pushes object B, then B pushes back on A, like two sides of the same coin. Labeling each force with two subscripts like this makes identifying its third law pair very easy. Simply flip the order of the subscripts. So the third law pair of the normal force exerted by the table on the book is the force exerted by the book on the table, which is also a normal force, by the way. It's a pushing force between the surfaces. The book is pushing down on the table with exactly the same strength as the table is pushing up on the book. That is what the third law is saying. This is a completely different force from the gravitational force exerted by the Earth on the book, even though in this case they happen to be equal. What is the third law pair of Fg? Well, now that we've identified the objects interacting, we just flip them. It's the gravitational force exerted by the book on the planet Earth. Wait, what? This tiny little book is pulling gravitationally on the entire planet Earth? The answer is yes. And in fact, so do you. You are pulling the planet Earth up with the exact same strength that it is pulling you down. Pretty cool, huh? Back to the most misleading example ever. We now have identified two separate action-reaction pairs. And within each pair, the forces must be equal in magnitude. But Newton's third law says nothing about the relative magnitudes of the two pairs. But wait, you might be thinking, isn't the book pressed into the table because of gravity? And the answer is yes, in this case, which again is the source of the confusion. But it doesn't have to be. And that's the point. You can have a normal force without gravity, and you can have gravity without a normal force. There's no fundamental link between them. So let's understand why these are the same in this case so that we can then figure out how they can be different. Ft on B and Fe on B are not a third law pair, but they do both act on the book which means they affect the book's motion as dictated by Newton's second law. The resulting acceleration of the book is the sum of all forces exerted on the book over the mass of the book. In this case, the book is stationary, which means its acceleration is zero. And therefore, the sum of all forces acting on it must also be zero. 
the second law gives 0 equals ft on b plus fe on b over m. So ft on b equals negative fe on b. Thus, fn and fg are equal and opposite because of Newton's second law, and only in the special case where fn and fg are the only two forces exerted on the object in the vertical direction and the vertical acceleration is zero. This second condition was the missing piece of information in my original example. I had said a mass m on a horizontal surface, but I did not specify if the object was accelerating or not. If we want to create a situation where the forces are not equal and opposite, we just have to accelerate the object in the vertical direction. There's many ways to do this. For example, if the surface is the floor of an elevator, which is moving down and coming to rest. Because its velocity is pointing down and getting smaller, the acceleration is pointing up. This means the unbalanced force acting on the book must also be up to cause this acceleration. And the only way to achieve this is for the normal force to be greater than mg. To really make sure that you understand this point, try to come up with as many examples as you can where the normal force is not equal to mg. And while you're at it, put the object on a ramp with angle theta and find an example where fn is not equal to mg cos theta. Try to break each condition separately or both at the same time. Feel free to share your examples in the comments to help each other out. Let's finally talk about Newton's first law, the most subtle and hence controversial of the three. Yes, I'm describing a centuries-old physics law as controversial. Often referred to as the law of inertia, it states that an object at rest remains at rest, and an object in motion remains in motion at constant speed and in a straight line unless acted on by an unbalanced force. Notice how both of the motions described in the law, remaining at rest or moving at a constant speed in a straight line, have zero acceleration. So this law is basically saying, your acceleration will be zero unless an unbalanced force acts on you. But don't we already know that from Newton's second law? If there's no unbalanced force on an object, its resulting acceleration will be zero. So it sure sounds like a special case of the second law. So what, if anything, does the first law offer that is not already covered by the second law? You may be surprised to learn that the answer to this question is not universally agreed upon. True story, I was recently talking with a physicist friend of mine and I asked him, how do you understand Newton's first law? He was like, F equals MA? I was like, no, that's the second law. <laughs> I mean the law of inertia. And he was like, oh yeah, that's the one that doesn't make any sense. Of course, he was joking, and we proceeded to have a very animated discussion about it. But for real, there is still quite a bit of debate about the correct way to interpret this law, even among professional physicists. Don't worry, we're not going to get into the weeds here. The purpose of this video is to help students who are currently studying physics, maybe for the first time, get a practical understanding of why this law is important. So I'm going to present the most widely accepted interpretation, which is also the most productive interpretation in our modern framework of physics. So here we go. Newton's first law makes a very important clarification for the second law, because the second law, taken by itself, is actually flawed. The problem with the second law is this. The measurement of an object's motion, in particular its acceleration, is relative. Or, in simpler terms, it's subjective. It depends on who is doing the measuring. For example, suppose there are two people in a train station. Alice is on the platform, and Bob is sitting on the train. As the train is pulling out of the station, Alice sees the train as accelerating forwards. But she sees herself and the platform as being and remaining at rest with zero acceleration. But from Bob's perspective, he and the train remain at rest with zero acceleration while Alice and the platform are accelerating backwards. In physics, Alice and Bob are called observers, and their relative perspectives are called reference frames, or just frames for short. So in physics speak, we say that acceleration is frame dependent. It depends on which reference frame you're measuring it in. Forces, on the other hand, are frame independent. Both Alice and Bob will agree that there are only two objects exerting forces on Alice. Earth is pulling her straight down, and the ground is pushing her straight up, with an equal and opposite force, but not because of Newton's third law. 
In particular, they both agree that she is not experiencing any horizontal force, that there is no object pushing or pulling her in the horizontal direction. So now, hopefully you can see the problem with Newton's second law. If forces are frame-independent, but acceleration is frame-dependent, then clearly this equation cannot hold in all reference frames. There must be some good frames where it works and some bad frames where it doesn't work. Let's see how Alice and Bob do. As already stated, both observers agree that Alice's force diagram looks like this. And we can see that there is no unbalanced force. In Alice's reference frame, Alice has no acceleration, and so Newton's second law works, zero equals zero. But in Bob's frame, Alice is accelerating backwards, even though there is no force pushing her backwards. Newton's second law does not hold. So Alice's frame is good, and Bob's frame is bad. Using more technical terminology, frames in which Newton's second law holds, like Alice's, are called inertial reference frames, or ERFs, as I'm told the kids say these days. And frames where it doesn't hold, like Bob's, are called non-inertial reference frames, or NERFs. You are probably not surprised by this revelation. Obviously, Alice's frame is better than Bob's because he's moving and she's not, right? And in some sense, yes, this is how many people can get by without really dwelling on the first law that much. We all have an innate feeling for what a good or inertial reference frame is. It's one that feels normal. Like when you're sitting at your desk, for all practical purposes, you're in an inertial reference frame and you can use Newton's second law. But also, if you're traveling in an airplane at 600 miles per hour, that also feels normal. In fact, if the windows were blacked out, you wouldn't be able to tell if you were flying or if you were parked on the tarmac. This is also an inertial reference frame, and you can use Newton's second law without worrying about how fast the airplane is moving. But if there's turbulence, you feel that. It's a deviation from an inertial reference frame, which is why objects seem to defy physics. You get jostled or accelerated from side to side, even though there is no object pushing or pulling you in that direction. That's because during turbulence, the airplane is in a non-inertial reference frame. It's all fine and good to have an intuition for something, but in physics, you have to have an objective measure. And that's where the first law comes in. It is the test to determine if a particular frame is an inertial reference frame. It is the definition, if you will, of an inertial reference frame. An inertial reference frame is a frame in which an object at rest remains at rest or if in motion will remain in uniform motion in a straight line unless acted on by an unbalanced force. If you feel like this is a circular definition, I can see why you would think that. It's like saying the second law only holds in an inertial reference frame and an inertial reference frame is one in which the second law holds. But the cool thing is that once a reference frame is established as inertial using one object, once it passes the test, then it's inertial for every object. So you only have to establish whether it's inertial once, and then you can use Newton's second law in every situation forever after. So that's it. Let's recap what our three laws of motion are. Law one, definition. An inertial reference frame is a reference frame in which an object at rest will remain at rest, and an object in motion will remain in motion at constant speed and in a straight line, unless acted on by an unbalanced force. Then the second law should clarify. In an inertial reference frame, as defined by the first law, the acceleration of an object is equal to the sum of all forces exerted on the object divided by the mass of the object. And finally, the third law says, for two objects A and B, the force exerted by A on B is equal in magnitude and opposite in direction to the force that B exerts back on A. So, this is what Newton's three laws of motion really mean. Hopefully, these explanations helped you write your leaning tower of physics knowledge. Which one did you find the most helpful? Let me know in the comments, and I'll see you next time.